hello and welcome. My name's Penny and this is Penelope's Chinwag. It's a special episode for me and I'll tell you why in a minute. It's, uh, I live in the southeast of England with my husband Pete and my four chickens and you're most welcome. I have a little chat about this and that. Oh and then I've got a fascinating fact about a lizard. I'm going to show you some things I've bought this week some things I'm going to be making, some things I have made, and a little film at the end. So welcome. Um, I, oh, I felt I was really, you know, the sun is pouring in. Um, maybe I should be in there. We'll see how we go. I might need to go in there, see if I can manage it. I don't want to be squinting and all that. Yeah, it's so hot in, in oh, so hot in the UK. It's beautiful today. But we have had some pretty scary weather, let's put it like that. So the film, I've put the music up. I put it up a few weeks ago, Love Conquers All, um, because it was Love Conquers All Day. And I found this lovely piece of music. And I've put it up this week with the film as well, because I've had a lot of love shown to me this week. It's been really lovely. Some friends came to visit and it made it very special and last week towards the end of the week I went out with a dear friend uh, to visit Goodenstone Park and that's part of the film and uh, we had a lovely day together so it's been really nice and not seeing too many people at the moment still every, every time we do see someone we love it's very special isn't it so let me show you what I've been doing uh, oh I've can you see Maisie? Let me get you Maisie. I've put some daisies on Maisie's bag. In the, in the book, it's to make uh, your animal a bracelet, but she didn't suit a bracelet. And so I put the daisies on her bag. I think that's rather nice. And I've got the blue to make her shoes a tea bar shoe she's going to have and the dark grey for the sole. So I think that'll be really nice. Yeah. So that's the next job on the list. Off you go with your friends. Well, my great grandson Tommy, I parked his pram there yesterday and uh, he, he, he scanned along the animals and reached out and touched Holly the Hedgehog's shoes and then a frown came over his face. What are these? They don't talk back to me. You can see it on his face. That's in the film at the end. I've made a start on the sloth or sloth. That's his face, <laughs> going to be his face. Normally you knit them from the bottom up and gather them up here. But this one, as you can see, is knitted from the back round to the front. So he's going to have two black eyes there. So I think he's going to be rather cute. And I've just got in the post. I had to get it from uh, Rito Hobby because Wool Warehouse didn't have the wool that I wanted. I'll open it, see what's in there. Well, I know what's in there. It's the Sloth's dressing gown. I haven't ever worked with this before. So I got this for his pyjamas. He's going to have stripe. Oh, can you see? The light's not very good. How about if I hold it like that? Cream and colour 528 and colour 172 I chose for his pyjamas and I thought that was rather yeah I didn't she puts him with a yellow star and a pale blue around the neck but I fancied that so I chose that and then oh I can't wait to knit this that's it that's all and this is look so soft Sheep is softly and that's going to be his dressing gown and he's got little slippers 
He's going to be a cute guy in that. You really are. <laughs> so I can't wait to do that. As you know, if you've knitted these or if you are knitting them, they're not quick things to knit, but they're very pleasurable. So that's, that's my parcel. I'll show you a picture of him. What's his name? Edward. Sleepy Edward is rarely seen out and about. When he's not in bed, he's most likely to be found curled up in an armchair in his comfy pyjamas, fluffy dressing gown and slippers, all coordinating, of course, and there he is. So I'm not putting the yellow star on or the pale blue. I'm doing those other colours. But he's going to be sweet. So that's where I am with my... These are the wild animals. I think he's next. Oh, it'll probably go on and on, won't it? I was watching Jeanette. She'd reminded me I'd made this little bag. And I find it really, really um, handy. It's so cute. And she sells, not Jeanette, but who I bought it from, sells some beautiful fabrics. And she's in Bath. And lovely lady runs it. And I bought a kit. I couldn't resist it. And it's called a macaroon. And you get you get the plastic macaroon. And you get a cute little zip. It's the Japanese zips, which are very heavy and easy to use. Really pretty. Uh, but I love the weight of them and you get the tiniest tiniest beads they really are tiddlers which goes round the outside and you get you get everything you need you get the pattern you get the two pieces of wadding you need you get the pattern mini macaron purse let me see if I can find a better there it is it's so pretty and there's the little beads that go around the outside yeah you can see that can't you if not I'll put a photo up see how it comes out it's a big picture of it so that zip goes right the way round that plastic and the fabric is this which sits nicely on that macaroon you see you're going to have a lot left over she gives you plenty and this for the other side love kitten and Sophie and Margaret so I'm going to have a bash at making that so that should be interesting and I'll put all the details down below yeah Rose Garden Patchwork she's got some beautiful things there if you fancy taking a look so I think that's what I'm making, what I'm going to make, what's in the pipeline. I can't think of anything else. Oh, I'm going to put a picture up this morning. A dear friend, Sonia, she sent me a picture of a teddy she's just made. It's a 1960s pattern. I think Sonia has a very large cupboard. And in that large cupboard, she's got a load of patterns that she saved from the 60s. And she's just made this teddy. And I thought he was such a cheerful guy. I said I'd put him up. So uh, here he is. So he cheered us all up this morning. Yeah. So the fascinating fact. Oh, I know. I'm going to tell you why it's a special episode. 52. Well, last year this time of year, I said to myself, shall I do? Well, my friend said, do it, do it, do it, do it. And I said, I can't do it. I don't know. Anyway, they persuaded me. And so I 
It wasn't called Penelope's Chinwag then. It took me a while to find the name I liked. It took me a while to decide what I was actually going to talk about. And anyway, I said I'd do a year. And this week, the year is up. It's episode 52. And I've managed 52 episodes in the year. Which I think is quite good going, really. So it's a bit of a special landmark. I'm supposed to be saying goodbye to you all now because I said I'll give myself a year. I'll see how it goes. And I've got some lovely subscribers. I've got some regular people that comment and we're getting to know each other. And um, my aunt, Anne, in Ireland, uh, she, because uh, it went up a little bit late, a couple of days late last week I think yes that's right it went up on Monday instead of Friday afternoon and um, oh got the message phone mum where's chinwag where's chinwag so yeah so I'll carry on doing it until I get the message that uh, that's enough thanks a lot so I'm going to do a fascinating fact and then I've got a little film and that's going to... Oh, I was going to tell you a little funny story. Shall I do that before the fascinating fact? Yeah, I will. Well, I think... Oh, yes, it must have been last year. We were all wearing masks and it was all, you know, and I'd made some masks. Ah, oh, that's right. But I had managed to get to see the hairdresser. It was February last year. And she doesn't live too far away, down this road, down that road. You know, an easy walk. And so it was Sunday after lunch and um, I said to Pete, shall we walk round there and drop the masks off and walk back and then uh, yeah, be quite, you know, stretch our legs. So off we went, delivered the masks. She was most grateful. And then we started walking home. And we came to a crossroads. It, it's quite a busy road. These roads are very quiet, but this road is quite busy. Now, oh yes, I've got to say about the lemon. Will you remind me? The lemon drizzle cake. Yeah, remind me. I want to say about that. Anyway, we're coming along the quiet road, approaching this road. What we have to do is cross straight over and go home. Easy. You would think it was easy. And because it's only a 10 minute walk, neither of us have taken our phones. We just set off with the masks just to deliver them. So when you come to this crossroad, literally just along the way a bit, there's a an island in the middle of the road. Now, of course, Pete doesn't use the island. He just waits till there's a gap in the traffic, crosses. And I said to him, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Um, I'm going to walk to the island and go across. Well, little did I realise he's had it done now. He had the wax taken out of his ear. This convinced him. I'd been saying, you're not hearing properly, love. And you know we've got a marvellous uh, place for hearing in, in, in the town. And he went along after this and got one out. And, yeah, it's fine now. Anyway, I said to him, standing on that, I said, I'm just going to walk up to there and I'm going to cross where I've got an island in the middle. Well, he didn't hear me. And as I said that, he turned round to look down the road that we'd just walked down. So he turned round, looked down there. I walked just a minute, second along there, went to the island and crossed over there. I turn round and he's not there because he'd turned round and seen I wasn't there. He hadn't heard that I was going to cross at the island. So he started walking back to find me. Well, as he walked back and I walked across the road by the time I turned round to see where he was I thought he'd just be crossing the road he wasn't there and 
so I didn't know what to think. Oh, I thought, as I walked along that bit, he must have darted across the road and, and walked on without me. He's never done that in his life before, but that's all I could think. He had vanished. But of course, as he turned round to look down the road, probably looking at a bird or something like that, I'd vanished because I'd just crossed to the island and zipped across. And as you cross over that road, the road that I was going to be walking up just veered, so I was out of sight. So we both thought we'd disappeared into midair. That's a weird feeling. Anyway, I thought, you must be ahead of me, must be ahead of me. I'll walk home. He'll be home. He'll have the kettle on. Walked home. Decent walk. No, ten, good 10 minute walk. Good 10 minute walk. Got home, all locked up, not there. Oh, I thought, I wonder if he went the long way round. But I looked down the road, nobody there. I thought, oh, I'll walk back, he'll be catching me up. I must have missed him. Walk back, not there. Walk back home. Asked a few people. There wasn't many people around Sunday afternoon on a February. Nope. I hadn't seen a gentleman. So I thought, I've, all I can do is walk back. I walk back. No, he's not there. So I start walking slowly home. And I see a lady in her front garden. And I said to her, have you seen a gentleman, grey hair, walking along here? No, she said. Why? I said, well, we were crossing the road together and he's vanished. Oh, she said, you want my next door neighbour who just drew up in his car and parked in his front garden. He knows everything. He knows what to do in any, any situation. I think he had been a fireman. Anyway, he said to yeah, me, right. have you got anyone you can phone? Well, of course. We hadn't taken our phones. We thought, oh, we're only going down there. We don't need our phone. But of course you need your phone. Of course. Both daughters have said, threatened us, you must never set foot outside the front door without your phones, which I generally I think is the, is the rule now. I've got a nice new phone and, yeah, we're all sorted out now. But on that particular day, we didn't have our phones. I didn't know anybody's number because everybody used to have landlines, I know those numbers, but they haven't got landlines anymore, they've only got mobiles, and I can't remember those off by heart. I know mine, but I don't know anybody else's. So we drew a blank there. Anyway, I walked back, he came round in his car, and it was starting to get really damp and chilly. And do you remember me telling you the story of when Pete fell down the hole? Um, in the drive, yes, that turned out to be a huge massive hole. Do you remember I showed you a photo of it? And if you haven't watched before, he was just out there sweeping the leaves and there'd been a, a leak in the road and that undermined everything and it, a sinkhole opened up basically. Anyway, he had a lucky escape there, but I think the weather was making making me feel like it was the, that day again, you know? And I was starting to get myself in a bit of a state. In fact, I wanted to sit in the curb. And I just, I remember saying to myself, don't sit in the curb, don't sit in the curb. Just walk about. Just, he'll be here in a minute. He'll be here in a minute. And uh, I wouldn't let myself sit in the curb. But what I wanted to do was sit down in the curb and just open my eyes and know that he would appear. But he didn't. So we waited and waited and waited and waited and after about 20 minutes oh no I think he said I remember him saying well it's been an hour now Penny I think we should phone the police oh the police I said oh I don't know phone the police do we need to he said well it's been an hour let me phone them let, leave it to me I'll phone them so he phoned the police and he said um I don't, can't remember what he said. I just wanted to sit down in the curb and I was stopping myself from doing it. And he came over and he said, I phoned the police, they've got him. 
I said, they've got him. What, has he collapsed? Is he poorly? Is he this? Is he that? He's fine. I said, what do you mean he's fine? How can he be fine with a policeman? He said, he'll be coming along in a minute. Coming along in a minute? Well, previous to that message getting through, this gent kind gentleman had said that I had lost my husband and they said, where are you? We'll send the police along. So the first thing we had turn up, which was for me, was a police car with two policemen in it. It was just like Last of the Summer Wine, if you ever watched that. These two police guys. Uh, of course, I looked in the car and said, well, there's no Pete. Where's Pete? Oh, no, he said, the gentleman who was rescuing me. This is the, your police car. They've come to see how things are. So they got out. I said, but you have got Pete. Oh, he said, we've got the message now. Yes, he phoned for the police too. And he's with them. I said, he phoned for the police. How did he do that? We'll find out, he said. Oh, here he comes. So a long, bold Pete in his own police car. I had a look. There he is, sitting in with this policeman. Well, I just opened the door. I threw myself on him. Oh, here's my little blackbird. You'll see. He comes in now. My friends were here and he came in, landed on the arm of the chair and asked us for some uh, currants. Anyway, where was I? Oh, please, got, yeah, he's got his own police car. I opened the door, I threw myself in there, absolutely threw my, never mind, you know, who, oh, we've all got masks on. I've never been so pleased to see anybody in my entire life. So what was the story? Of course, then I started getting agitated, you know, well... But why didn't you just cross the road with me? He said, but you disappeared. He said, <laughs> I had to go in. I knocked on this uh, uh, person's house and I said, I've lost my wife. He said, I literally turned round and she's not there. Well, well, he should be here telling the story, shouldn't he? But he said, my wife would never leave me. I mean, my wife asked me, are you all right, dear? Are you this? Are you that? She just would not go off on her own. She must have been... She, she must have been abducted. He knew I hadn't been abducted because he said to them, she'd scream her head off. But what else could have happened? That's really the moral of the story is if you've got wax in your ear, do get it removed. Because if you can't hear your wife say she's going to cross the road, you know, it can be a little bit, uh, yeah, lead to one thing leading to another. So that was it. He said to the police, she's just vanished. So he said that four minutes later, the police arrived, and they picked him up and they said, well, we've just got a call that, that she's at home. So down the road came his police car. So we had, uh, I, think, I think there was one chap in his car or two and one in mine. So we had three or four policemen on our drive um, and they said, they all stood there like the police in Last of the Summer Wine. Ah, they said, wouldn't it be lovely if every shout ended like this? Because we were both so shaken up. That's right. So we came in, he said, right, what can I do for you? I said, make me a big bowl of pasta. He's making me a big bowl of pasta now. That's what reminded me. Make me a big bowl of pasta. So we sat quietly and had our pasta. <laughs> And we kept talking about it. I mean, it was just so, well, how can, well, so you, it is possible to lose someone crossing the road. Of course, it's the butt of the jokes now, isn't it? Butt of the jokes. Mom, don't lose each other, you know, all of that. So it was a happy ending, but uh, it was a horrible afternoon. <laughs> the afternoon. We lost each other crossing the road. Well, we have, we've got another family saying as well this week because last week I asked him to test the lemon drizzle cake and when our friends arrived and we were having cake, oh, we said, this is delicious. 
it's so creamy with that lemon curd in it. I said, well, why didn't you say that on Chinwag? What did you say? Do you want a written statement? So that's our, that's our, our family saying now. Well, do you want a written statement? <laughs> so that was funny too. So I think I've talked rather a lot now. I don't think I'm going to do a fascinating fact this week. I'm just going to wrap it up and I'm going to say um, the film now is of going with my friend Heather to Goodenstone Park and then my friend Heather and Francis coming to stay. Now they, <coughs> Francis was coming Monday to Wednesday but Heather, she's the one that writes the poems. She was only coming to escort, to accompany and keep keep company with, with Francis and then she was going to turn around and go back home on the train. But of course we've had well, we've had unprecedented weather, the hottest weather that the UK has ever seen. And of course, all the rails buckled and no trains were running till Wednesday afternoon. So it was quite a joy. We, they stayed till Wednesday afternoon and uh, we had a lovely time. And when you go down the 39 steps, once the, it, the sun is there in the morning, so once the sun's gone round, down there is in the shade. And we went down there on the hottest day of ever recorded in the UK in the shade and we sat there for two and a half hours waiting for that that tide to come in. And my friend Heather who writes the poems, she is allergic to sun. So she has like a big beekeeper's hat on and gloves but it was a joy because down there in the shade with the tide coming in she could take her gloves off, her hat off and whilst the rest of the country, well, my daughter Kim, she put up a little film five miles from her house. Um, my great granddaughter's, my granddaughter and obviously great granddaughter's house, five miles from their houses. Um, houses were catching a light, 12 fire engines, and of course it only needed a spark because we haven't had any rain. And another part of the film is just walking down the garden this morning. He just walked round the garden. I filmed him from upstairs because we haven't got a pond at the moment. We can't fill it up. We've got a water shortage. Uh, we haven't got a pond. He was just looking at his plants. Uh, we do plant plants that don't need too much water, but, you know, they have been rather cooked. Exactly. So that's... Uh, Little Tom is sitting up now. Mila was making, she went away with her nan and granddad and uncle and auntie and they went down to Devon and she was, I think she had like balloons filled with water and was slapping them down. So that was nice and cool for her. What else is in the film? I think that's it. Just the little little blackbird that's just asked me for some currants he came in and yeah we haven't seen the fox I expect he's just been keeping in the call oh yes yes our, our friends did see the fox he was out there in the morning when we, we went out there for breakfast and also uh, in the evening Mrs Tiggerwinkle the uh, hedgehog walked along so quite a lot happens on this little bit of patio here so thank you for joining. Oh, I've got a voice. I'll, I'll do the uh, fascinating fact now. The Australian thorny devil lizard. I must say I'd never heard of one. Maybe if you're an Australian viewer, you will know about them. But it extracts moisture from fog, humidity and wet sand. And I think <laughs> some people in the UK this week had wished that they could too. It channels the water to its mouth. For drinking but we ask ourselves how and the answer lies in the the amazing skin the devil's skin is overlaid well not the devil's skin the thorny devil's skin is overlaid with scales 
and some scientists think that the moisture or dew collected on the scales runs down to the rough surface of the skin and enters the skin's network of half-open channels or grooves located between the scales. These channels are interconnected and lead to the sides of the thorny devil's mouth. Isn't that clever? But how does it draw up the water, up its legs, across its body, and then into its mouth? It defies gravity in the process. Gravity, we know, is going down, isn't it? But this is drawing it up. How does it do it? How does it extract moisture from wet surfaces? Well, it, by rubbing its belly against them. Well, researchers have apparently unveiled the thorny devil's secret. The channels on the surface of the skin are connected by way of ducts to another network of channels below within the lizard's skin. And this structure has capillary action, a phenomenon in which water is drawn into narrow spaces even against the force of gravity. And so the lizard's skin acts like a sponge. So Janine Benyus, president of the Biomimicry Institute, says that mimicking moisture extracting technologies, it may help engineers design a system to remove humidity from air in order to cool buildings more efficiently and also to obtain drinking water. Well, that would have been good this week. And that's the thing with our houses, you know, in the UK. We're just not, we haven't got air calm. We're just not designed for those temperatures. But there's that lizard. He buries himself in the sand, rubs his belly against it. The capillary action draws the water out of the sand and down into his mouth. And of course, engineers are trying to copy that. Truly amazing, a fascinating fact. So I'll say cheerio on my 52nd episode. So have a lovely week yourselves, wherever you are. And thank you for all your comments. I value them so much. Take care of yourselves. Bye. In the little village, just south of the border, about their father